right. Welcome back, everybody, to Unboxing Performance. This is going to be episode 11 uh, for going over our end services. So last last episode, Vince went over FAI, um, etiology, symptoms, going into examination measures, interventions, um, and then adding a case study in that had some really, really great stuff. Hopefully, you guys have checked it out. If not, go back and check it out, especially if you're treating anyone uh that you are looking for some inspiration and interventions they have a really cool program they went through that you can definitely plug and play for different diagnoses but good episode overall so go ahead and check it out today i'm going to be going over mine which is going to be over cervical radiculopathy in my setting that i'm currently working in um, for my rotation is with eli Lilly. so we have a it's a pharmaceutical company there's a lot of people who do a lot of office desk work and so we see a lot of postural changes. We see a lot of numbness and tingling in the hands. Luckily on site, we have a ergonomics team that'll go and do assessments for anyone in the building so they can help there. But as the symptom starts, they can come see us in the physical therapy uh, room department and come to our clinic. So let me turn on share. Okay, what do you see? I see a Google slide. Okay. Can you still see it? Yeah. Okay, I don't have my bar, whatever. Does it just say this part or does it have like the web browser at the top? Just has the page, no browser. Yeah, it's gonna work. Okay, um, so going over cervical radiculopathy, went through some objectives here. Uh, first thing I plan on doing is defining what what is cervical radiculopathy and going through the CPG that breaks down neck pain into its different categories. And then discussing examination measures for acute and chronic cases, some interventions. Um, it's at objective four, which is non-physical therapy referral needs, differential stuff. That's actually going to be um, before examination put on here uh, mentioned. And then the last bullet is going to be more for when I present this in my clinic for open discussion on education patients, educating patients, because I want to get everyone talking about it. So people with more experience for people who have less experience. So that way it can facilitate a good conversation and hopefully improve the management of all these patients that we see. So anytime you're looking at the upper neck, you definitely want to be considering if there's anything that could be going on. This is pulled directly from the CPG, which is linked on the next slide, which I'll upload this slide into our Google Drive as well. Um, but all of these are things that could be going on when you're seeing neural symptoms and anything that's originating in the neck that you want to be checking out. So um, starting with the second column, ligaments, ligamentous instability, if there was any sort of injury trauma, that's definitely something we want to be clearing if there hasn't been x-rays or MRIs that has showed they are cleared and okay. Um, and if you see anything that makes you think that there might be some ligamentous changes and spinal cord compression, 911, get them to the hospital just before something happens. Uh, the other thing you want to consider is any sort of VBI stuff. If there's some vascular changes um, for blood flow to the brain, that can be really, really dangerous. You want to make sure that you're clearing that. Granted, our tests for it aren't great. Um, so taking a good history, seeing if there's anything that they have cardio-wise that might be a thing. Also considering if there was a trauma event. And then if there's anything that just doesn't sit right with you, make sure that they're going to go get checked out. Um, and then that goes into the history of blood pressure, history of myocardial infarction. If there's some vascular changes, you might feel or see different things occurring in the neck region. Um, going back to the left column, space occupying lesions. So if there's osteophytosis, a herniated disc, that could be going into the peripheral side if it's um, protruding into the peripheral nerve roots. It could also be if there's something weird going on, I guess, pushing on the spinal cord, but this was in there. Um, cervical myelopathy is something we want to consider. Um, general central canal stenosis, which could be congenital or age related. These are all things that we could, could be going on that may be related to any sort of radiculopathy symptoms. Um, again, considering trauma, uh, infection, and if there's been any cancer. These are all things you just want to consider. It doesn't mean we can't treat. It just means we need to be considering if there's anything that could be going on related to. Uh, so the neck pain, CPG breaks down neck pain into four different categories, acute and chronic. 
one being with mobility deficits, one looking at movement coordination deficits, one being related to headaches, and one being related to radiating pain. Uh, one category doesn't necessarily disbar a patient from being in a different category. There could be a chicken and the egg starting with one deficit that led to another, uh, but your treatment in your exam is going to be specific to how they're presenting. So putting them in one of these categories is going to make things easier for you going forward. Um, this is another thing that I was going to have when I actually present, because we have a lot of clinicians who worked with this, going back to if they fit in multiple categories, if they're in the radiculopathy category, based on how they're presenting at this time, we want to treat that. But how often does it happen in isolation? Because there's been a mobility deficit or movement coordination deficit that has led to this. Looking outside the neck, what's their posture look like? What's their work setting look like? Uh, is there weaknesses or other things going on in other regions of the body that may be contributing to this presentation? And how do we treat that as well to prevent this from recurring? So if you're having a patient ex experiencing acute neck pain with radiating pain, basic symptoms they're going to be talking about is they're gonna have pain in the neck. Um, and that's gonna be going into the upper extremity. That's what the radiation means. Other things you may see uh, are gonna be some dermatotal patterns. So some paresthesia, some numbness and tingling you might see. Uh, strength changes, uh, especially in grip. And so some of the things that you're gonna look at, there's a cluster there that is um, has the highest high likelihood ratio of some of the special tests that you're gonna wanna do that's gonna confirm or say that it's not radiating pain. Um, but upper, upper limb neural tension testing, uh, so whether it's radial, medial, or ulnar nerve, it's positive and it, it's gonna reproduce symptoms. Spurling, which is the rotation and compression. Um, and that would reproduce symptoms. Distraction would reduce symptoms, taking any pressure off of that nerve root, and then cervical range of motion uh, may be limited or reproducing symptoms. Other things that you're gonna wanna do is assess for any sort of upper motor neuron changes uh, that may be demoing some of the same thing. So checking for sensory tension for motor, does it make sense? Uh, and then looking at ref reflex testing, or abnormal upper motor, upper motor neuron signs. Um, so if, it, if it's been a while since you've looked at neural, te neural tension testing or haven't done it in a while, this is gonna be the radial nerve one. What you're doing is you're gonna have abduction of the shoulder, the elbow is gonna be extended, and then you're going to be flexing at the wrist with some pronation and you're moving your head away. This right here is determining whether it's peripheralized or centralized. If you get more turning on of symptoms with wrist movement, as opposed to neck movement, it's more likely peripheralized. If you're getting more changes by changing the position of the head, it's more centralized. Regardless, you're probably going to, or you will use both with that nerve glide there at the end, but this is the way to set it up. Uh, and then looking at the median nerve, it's a great little refresher. If you ever need it, I still go back and look at all of these anytime I have someone coming in before I do an eval, just so I can, have a better idea if I'm going to set this up. Oh, yeah. So one of the things that you're going to do, yes. I've done. I do these a lot. I got a lot of got lot of neural tension patients. That was it. That was just my little. Oh. <laughs> uh, no. No question. Yeah. So looking at the. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were about to ask a question. Uh, so looking at the median nerve. Uh, another thing that's not mentioned here is shoulder depression. You yes, you want to abduct um in the shoulder but you also want to make sure that it's not drifting up into shoulder elevation there you want to make sure that shoulder's planted on the table bring the arm out you're going to supinate and extend the wrist bringing them into external rotation and then bring their hand out if you're getting symptoms with just that you can back off and then test for centralization same thing as the last slide uh, and then ulnar nerve walking through a nice quick quick checklist add back the shoulder rotate out flex pronate, and then you're extending the wrist and the hand. So these are all of the different setup positions that we have for all three nerves. Uh, for chronic neck pain with radiating symptoms interventions, it's the same for acute. I'm still tweaking the slides a little bit, but it's mostly done. So don't worry about acute versus chronic. What you're going to do is going to be mostly similar. Um, and I kind of broke down my interventions into two different categories. First one is going to be symptom management. So what, what's, how are they presenting today? If you're gonna have 
any sort of radiculopathy, expect traction to be helpful. It's definitely something that you're going to be wanting to do, whether it's mechanical or manual. See if you can give them some relief, especially on day one. They're going to buy in that what you're able to do in the clinic is going to be helpful. Um, and it, it just gives you an opportunity to make the patient feel better. Um, secondly, you're going to want to look at the joints below, thoracic mobilization manipulation whichever is appropriate for that patient and based on what your scope of practice is in the state that you're operating in. If you're allowed to do manipulations, I know some places can't call it a manip or they have to call it grade five. I know there's differences or whatever, um, but you're definitely gonna be looking at the thoracic cage and how it affects how the cervical um, spine is moving. And you may be able to generate some relief just by getting some movement below the cervical spine. Um, we talked about neural mobilization. So looking at those, uh, neural tension tests, those are also treatments, taking them in, seeing if you can get some nerve glides that provide some relief or able to move symptoms towards back towards the central region as opposed to the distal extremities. Um, starting on some cervical strengthening, uh, have that in symptom management just because you might be able to teach them how to move a little bit more. And even if you can just teach them how to get some upper cervical flexion and some lower cervical extension, you might be able to give them some self-gapping that they aren't normally doing, which may help with symptoms. Um, and then soft tissue mobility. Uh, a lot, every single pa a lot, every single patient that I've seen so far that has any sort of radiating pain either was experiencing and is getting better with before I saw them, or when I first saw them was experiencing some sort of soft tissue restriction, whether it's cervical paraspinals, suboccipitals, scalenes, upper trap, levator, all of these muscles are tight whether that there was a postural change that led to muscle tightness and then onset the symptoms or if symptoms just made them lock up their neck and those muscles got really tight because of it, I'm not sure. But re reducing those tissues, even if it isn't directly to the radiating pain, has I anecdotally provided relief. I mean, if you have a tight muscle that's not working well, anyone's gonna feel better after you help release it and get it moving better. Mm -hmm. um, so that's more like, addressing where they are, addressing their presentation, and then get moving over to postural retraining. Most of these patients are forward head, rounded shoulders, weak scaps, um, maybe don't understand what uh, proper ergonomics or proper body mechanics looks like. They'll Almost everyone can be like, yeah, I probably don't sit really well. I probably don't do great things. I don't move a lot um, as, or as much as I used to. And I know my posture is not good, but prop giving some proper education regarding what posture should like, what does that mean? And then teaching people how to move again and the promotion of any sort of aerobic or cardiovascular training is helpful in all chronic pain patients um, that I've gathered from a different article. The links aren't in here yet, but aerobic training is helpful with all chronic pain. So if you can get them moving in any sort of way, it's going to be beneficial. Um, One, and then what are some motor control? Are you going to go into ATP stuff at all with that? Um, I don't have a slide talking about it. Okay, but I can. Okay, you what may you may address this questions? later. I feel like there there's a lot of room to send them home with things to work on in the meantime. But oh, absolutely. Yeah. Keep um, going. Keep going. So well, well, I don't in this. Okay, uh, let's chat but, later. Let's chat later. We'll, we'll come back to that at the end. Because the CCS so stuff will be good. Some too. of, yeah. So looking at, we, we talked about cervical strengthening on this slide as part of symptom management. Some of the things that we want to address, if you forgot the muscles, I had to go back and I forgot <laughs> rectus capitis anterior and rectus capitis, capitis lateralis were there. Like I knew they were there, but I forgot, oh yeah, those are the muscles that were also training. So it's always good to go back to the anatomy, review the things. These are the muscles that we're looking at that are going to help control upper cervical flexion. And this is going to help us with cervical extension. So those combined movements are going to help us. If there's a forward head posture, you flex in the upper cervical region and extend through the lower cervical region is going to move us towards better posture. If something has changed. And so I decided to look up a cool, uh, a couple of different exercises that I haven't been using in clinic that I knew existed, but wanted to just Go out and see what else, see what other clinicians are doing. So I found um, two videos, one directly from Physiopedia, which is on YouTube, but I found it on their uh, discussion of activating deep cervical flexors, and then the next one will play afterwards. But this is a pretty cool exercise, and I'm just going to skip to where they start going over it. 
But essentially what he's doing is so you get a band so right being here able... and it's right around C2. You have them in front of a mirror, so they're able to watch what's going on. And it does not need to be a heavy band. This is, looks like a green. In my clinic, a green would be really heavy depending on uh, what your clinic, who their supplier is. Obviously, the colors are different. I would be starting with something very, very, very light. And this may not be a day one exercise. This could be like week two mm -hmm. as we are teaching them. We're getting them calmed down. But what it's doing is it also engages a little bit of upper cervical extension and you're getting some lower cervical flexion in this position. Yeah. And so you are going to have them protract and depress their shoulders. So most of the motion has to come from here and your hands are going to be here providing some tactile feedback and they're going to watch their head moves and you're going to help them move through this motion before you kind of lock in and stabilize for them. Teaching a chin tuck. Let's see, he should go through it. But you basically have them over protract, which may be some symptomatics. If they're, you know, excessively painful, you're not going to well, do to stabilize her shoulder uh, girdle. I just made this exercise a whole lot better. Have them now, the second point is, is I have her holding onto a mirror. So now she's got visual right. feedback you, you on what this should look like, which if you yeah. have somebody with cervical I, I dysfunction. I hear the audio from there. And I hear you. I barely hear you, but I can hear you talking a little bit. Uh, I don't get any of the audio. That's interesting. Oh, it's loud. It's loud. So, okay. Well, then I'm just going to skip. Okay. Skip ahead. But this, essentially, this is the setup. And here she's starting to pull back. You're doing a chin tuck into that band. So you're forcing some cervical flexion in the upper cervical region and some extension in the lower cervical region. I thought that was a cool exercise that I hadn't thought of. No, that's good. We, I definitely have some patients I can bring this with. I may try um, it. And then, I'll let you know how it goes. I was like, I'm going to try doing it myself as well. You got neck and issues? And looking at this next one. What was that? You got neck issues? Always. Who doesn't? I sit hunched over at a computer all day while I'm working with patients. It's not good posture. Do as I say, not as I do is what I say almost every day. Um, let's see. These are from the prehab guys. I love their guys' channel. I think it's really good um, on Instagram. They also have some good stuff on YouTube. But you're basically coaching some flexion through here mm -hmm. and then setting them up where they have to move through the different parts of their neck. And he's going to slide this phone to encourage flexion, more like mobility. Mm -hmm. And so you basically place their eyes on an object and their eyes are going to follow. And you could do this with a strap or something on a table. Um, have someone stand behind and pull it through and then you pull it this way but you see he just naturally follows it yeah and then you're going to coach and you can use some tactile feedback about trying to move at each individual segment as you pull up mm -hmm. while maintaining a chin tuck here so this is a, a nice exercise to progress from where you're going now with gravity that makes it tougher to engage all of these muscles i think we spend a lot of time in our clinic talking about um cervical flexion, um, chin tucks, chin tucks with some range of motion. We don't do a lot of uh, lower multifidi training, which is something that while doing this, I was like, you know, I don't do a lot of this. Maybe this might be something that'll be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to mix this in, which I thought would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, and it's also a diagnosis that I didn't feel super comfortable and confident in the way maybe some other ones had. So it was a good refresher for me. Yeah, no, I agree. One thing, one thing I found that we have at the clinic is those biofeedback air pads, like the the blood pressure cuff, but like not a blood pressure cuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I I started using that for a lot of like my DNF and like CCF treatment, and it's been great. I the the visual feedback I feel like is just is huge for people because cervical musculature is so like overlooked i feel like for a lot of people they don't even like consider it they're just like the justification is like oh i use my head every day like it's obviously getting strength but it's like you know you're just perpetually living in this compensated state and now we're just seeing kind of repercussions of that that were onset by something in particular yep um, one of the things that I do as a feedback for them 
is we have a lot of people who are have a lot of tone um, in their anterior neck uh, musculature. Mm-hmm. And so what I'll do is I'll have them place their hands either like this or the, along their, their scalenes and their SEM so they can feel them. Yeah. And then I'll tell them, all right, I want you to do a chin tuck. Do you feel those muscles touching your hand turning on? That is not supposed to happen. I word, word this better, but essentially I'm saying we're trying to train these muscles that align deep inside that you can't see. So we're going to try this chin tuck and it's so gentle that I want you to feel your head move and try not to let these muscles engage you'll feel if they turn on you're knowing you're doing too much yeah i want you to keep trying and keep trying until these can't do it and these aren't turning on as the motion is going if your head is able to turn into that chin tuck without these turning on the only muscles that can be controlling that are the deep ones you know you're doing it correctly and so we'll walk through that for you know 15 20 reps like oh how'd you feel da, 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 until they're able to get a chin tuck without feeling these big muscles turning on for them right since we don't have a, a cuff, hilariously, I don't, I don't know. I mean, why. you could just use your blood pressure cuff if you have your kit. I could bring my kit. I haven't brought my kit a single day because we've had everything else that needed. I could bring mine. Um, home exercise. Yeah. So you had a question. I think there's a lot of things you could send them home with. One thing me and my CI talk about are like, what would you actually give them? And what are they going to do? And he shared with me basically a study that says like the most the most exercises a patient will do like and can will be consistent with on average is about four. So what would you like? What would you prioritize? As, so we like, do less. You do three. We give three. All right. On day. What would be three three things you would try to send them home with? if this was like their sole deficit kind of thing. First thing I'm giving is going to be chin tucks. Okay. We're going to spend probably 10 to 15 minutes trying to teach them how to turn on muscles if they aren't able to do it, especially if there's a postural deficit Mm -hmm. in the clinic. And I'm giving that. I was like, hey, there's a reason we're doing this. This is a, I'll tell them about motor control and motor learning. If we're trying to retrain a movement pattern, if we're trying to teach a muscle to start doing its job again without other muscles taking over for it, we need to do it a lot. That means not just that when you come in here, that means every single day, multiple times a yeah. day. So whether it's waking up in the morning before you even move, just trying to get your neck moving a little bit, maybe that wakes you up for the day. There, well, sitting at the desk, you know that you've been sitting in, like setting a timer after like three or four hours, you probably haven't done anything. Like, so like I'm coaching them through how to make it integrated into their yeah. day, but that is day one exercise I'm giving. We are turning on the muscles they're supposed to be turning on. Do you guys on. use uh, a med bridge or like a... Medbridge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we use Medbridge. I love that uh, students don't have access to it. They're switching at the end of the month right after we leave to a new one that allows students to have their own. Oh, I wish. Um, I always, my CI uh, and I are a little frustrated with that too because we use Medbridge. Oh, it sucks. It sucks when you have overlapping patients and we each have our own caseload, but I have to take them away from their computer while my patient's sitting over there doing nothing when I could have been doing this the whole yep. time. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, chin tucks that is day one that I'm giving especially in a highly acute patient with some severe symptoms that is a simple exercise that's usually non-provoking that's going home number two is if there was like whichever nerve was the most biased if we can get them to where they feel comfortable and confident doing the movement I'll give them that if they don't demonstrate the ability to do a nerve glide very well on their own I'm going to hold that in clinic just so on the off chance they don't tension it and make it worse that's fair. So until I feel really confident that they're good at doing it without, with proper mechanics, with understanding of why we're doing it, with understanding of don't go into symptoms, don't go into symptoms, nerves don't like it. It usually has taken like a week or two and they're like, and they're like oh yeah, I forgot. To, I'm not supposed to put tension on it. I, I, I want to stay below. So I don't want to give them something that could be provoking, even though it, it when done correctly is going to be helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, especially with people who don't get it yet. Next is going to be usually some sort of scapular. Because most of these people are presenting with some sort of postural imbalance, I'm trying to teach depressions and retractions, and I'm going to give them this two different exercises. So I'm trying to teach them that they, yes, often it's a combined movement, but I'm going to, one, give them 
the ability, like try and teach them how to actually retract the shoulder blades and know what that position should feel like. And, and, and I'll say to them, we are overemphasizing this movement. You don't need to walk around with your shoulder blades touching each other every day. They don't need to be hugged like this the entire time for 24 hours. That's not normal movement, but teaching them to overemphasize the movement so those muscles are engaging to their fullest ability. And then same thing with scat depression, teaching them how to push I down. think that is, that's a great point with exercise being, exercise, especially like postural control exercises, and stuff like that being an over-exaggeration because I have a lot of patients that are just like, I tell them, like, all right, you're doing it. It's subtle, but you're doing it. Now try to make it more and make it more, basically. And yeah. teaching them, like, all right, you got that? Now, like, make it dramatic. Like, really bring it out. And I feel like once they're able to find the, like, the end range of those motions, like, being able to sit now in the middle of it is easier. And essentially, in the middle is where, that postural ideal kind of sits. Equilibrium, yeah. With, with all that, so yeah, that's a great point. And bringing it back to like, no, you're not. So I had, I've had a couple of patients where I realized I hadn't been saying what proper is what you just said with the mm -hmm. mid range. And I had someone ask me, "Am my shoulder blade supposed to be like this all the time?" I go, oh, "No, no, no. You're supposed to be able to move there. You're supposed to be able to feel." like you're able to sit tall and correct yourself when you notice yourself pulling out of position but you're not supposed to walk around like this exactly and so i've started adding that into my education like we are overemphasizing so that it's easy to be in a normal resting position as opposed to where we're at now and at the end range of that motion so that's something i've been working on educating people with. Nice. um so those are the three that i would give it's usually be scat retract scat depression and chin tucks okay. I will sub in upper limb neural tension for one of the retraction depressions, or if I feel like they can do all four, I'll do that. But that's only if I feel like they have a really, really, really yeah. solid understanding of why we're doing it, a glider or a slider, and they're not going to yeah. think. Once you, once you're able to assess competency with movement, yeah. So that's that's the ATP that I'm sending them home with. All right, nice. And using manual to get some buy-in on yeah. that one. Huge. Whether it's soft tissue, Lay, track, laying hands, anything I can do to make them feel better. All right. Hands on. All right, that is it. Any other questions? For no, me? I think you did great. You covered a lot. Uh, you touched a lot of bases that I'm familiar with, and basically dusted off a lot of cobwebs right now for me. So all good stuff. I think they'll like it. Cool. All right. All righty. Uh, same thing. I'll put this uh, slide deck into our show notes. You'll have the links and access to it. If you have any questions, feel free to email, email us at, I'll actually put the email at the end of the episode, which I haven't been doing. It'll also be in the show notes at the bottom, in the comments. I'll show Unboxing performance, episode 11, we crossed into double digits. Take care. Nice. Later, y'all.